Welcome to Debbie DeVries Ministries. Now today we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I had the privilege of listening to my friend uh, Cheryl Scott speak on Acts 10. And quite frankly, it fits in beautifully uh, with the last four weeks we, with us going through the book of Jonah. So I've asked Cheryl if she would record what she spoke on and if she would share it with us. And um, so that's what she did. So welcome, Cheryl, and thank you for, for sharing the insight, the truth that is found in Acts 10. I grew up in northern New Brunswick. I bragged about that a few times before, and maybe some of you know why I brag about it. You've been there on vacation. You know why I love it there. Others of you, not so much. You've never hit the East Coast, so you don't know much about it. But let me share my memories of my New Brunswick with you, the place where I grew up. Now, it's what you would call the country, not the country, the country. In fact, I've often said, I'm from the boonies. I'm talking where I live, there were no street lights in sight. We had one channel on TV, channel six, that's if it came in. We had one car, family of seven. Yeah, I'm not sure, I don't know either, but you know what, there are no seatbelt rules back then, so you could just squish people in. For a while, we plucked our own chickens, drank powdered milk, watered down tang, and bologna was a staple. I'm pretty sure bologna still is a staple. We swam in a river that was like 30 steps away from the house. In fact, on the way out the door, you'd often hear mom yell, take the shampoo with ya. My New Brunswick could be described by that comedian, Jeff Foxworthy, you know, the guy who tells all the redneck jokes. Like if you met your wife at a yard sale, you might be a redneck. Or if you have a complete set of salad bowls and they all say Cool Whip on the side, you might be a redneck. Or if your wife has ever said, honey, move the transmission so I can take a bath, you, my friend, might be a redneck. Yeah, those jokes, I can relate to those jokes. My world existed of swimming in the river, playing in the woods, going to my church, my school. I knew everyone where everyone lived, who had brothers or sisters, what car they drove, what pets they had. I'd never really been anywhere else. The folks at my table consisted of a lot of folks who looked just like me, ate the things I ate, talked the way I talked. That's all I knew. The God I knew was kind, loving. He loved me and my family and all the people that went to my church that sang like we did, that prayed like we did, that followed the rules and regulations that we did. I learned the verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But my view of the world was very, very small. My table was comfortable, clean, and familiar. Then I moved away. I sat at other tables, tables that served things that I'd never tasted before. Tables that had people in the chairs that I had never met. People who did not look remotely like me. Tables that had strange aromas and different colored settings. Sometimes I had to lean in to understand an accent or I'd find myself laughing at a, a clever joke that I'd never heard before. I had to appreciate looking across at the table seated there in wonder. I had discussions that left me in awe. I saw things in a different light. They prayed differently. They sang differently. And in all this, I started to marvel at how God created us all. So unique, so individual, so valued, so precious. My world became so much more, so much bigger. It wasn't always comfortable, clean, or familiar. And my understanding of God and his incredible love and his church grew and expanded exponentially. Now, I want to tell you a crazy story today. Now, some of you might be thinking, you yeah, already told us that you plucked your own chickens. You don't get much crazier than that. But believe me, this story's crazier. This is a story of how the church began. The, the church, capital T, capital C. Now, this story is found in the book of Acts chapter 10, and we've been sifting through this heavy lifter these past few weeks, this historical book, this history has been written down as fact. 
It's a true story and it's crazy. You know that saying, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's this story. Now, this story has two main characters, a guy named Cornelius and a guy named Peter. There are 48 verses in Acts 10. So because of time, we're just going to hit a few. You can read the whole chapter this week. In fact, you know what? I dare you to read the whole chapter this week. I mean, I double dog dare you. Okay, let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. Acts 10, verse 1. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Okay, now, if we had a table right here, we would say at the end of this table, let's say we have Cornelius, right? Now, what do we see from that text that helps us know anything about this guy? Well, he lived in Caesarea. Caesarea was a city in Israel well known for its incredible seaport, its amphitheater, which, by the way, baffles architects to this day. They don't know how the builders back then made such an impressive structure without modern technology. Caesarea was a place known for its, its many temples, its palaces, one of which was the home of King Herod. Now, I'm not sure if you recall him, but he was the king who wanted the wise men to find baby Jesus so he could, quote, worship him, when in fact his plan was to eliminate him. So that's where Cornelius is stationed in Caesarea as a Roman army officer. Now, Cornelius, he was a big deal around there. He wasn't just an officer. He was a captain of the Italian regiment or a centurion, they would be called. In ancient Rome, being a centurion meant that you were a captain of 100 soldiers. A centurion was usually someone who was loyal and courageous. He would start as a soldier and work his way up the ranks. He would have been noticed by the general for all his skill and his courage in battle. Centurions would get paid 10 times more than a soldier did, but that was good. That was okay because the verse says Cornelius was devout, he feared God, he prayed regularly, and he gave generously to the poor. So he made bank and he shared bank. You know, this Cornelius guy, he sounds like a pretty great guy. Like he sounds like someone you'd like to have on your side. But let's see what craziness happens to him. Okay, verse three. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel, and the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius sent two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. Okay, so things began crazy up in Cornelius's life. Cornelius has a vision. And you think, mm, that sounds a little weird, but we got to keep in mind this happened in biblical times. The Bible records this a few times. It was one of the ways in which God spoke to people. So an angel appears in this vision and speaks to him, gives him an assignment, sends some men to find Peter. Okay, keep going. Enter character number two. So in this chair at the table, we have Peter, sometimes known as Simon Peter. Now, Peter, he's a little more of a familiar character than Cornelius. You may have heard about him before or know some of his story. I mean, this is the same Peter that was the fisherman who became one of Jesus' closest followers. This was the guy who, when Jesus and his disciples were sitting around together and Jesus pulls out a, a, a basin of water and a cloth and he starts to wash their feet. Peter says, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. No way. But when Jesus explains why, Peter changes his tune. He says, well, then don't just wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head. This is the same Peter who, when Jesus was arrested, he pulled out a sword and cut off the soldier's ear. The same Peter who denied even knowing who Jesus was three times. And the same guy who stepped out of the boat in the middle of a raging storm to walk on water to Jesus. Now, what does all this tell us about Peter? Well, he was one of those guys who gets amped up, you know? He gets excited about everything. He's all in. He's one of those guys who spoke in haste. He didn't always think before he opened his mouth. And he often said foolish things. 
He was outspoken, irritable, capable of great anger, but he had great love. He was determined to be Jesus' best follower. He sounds a little different than Cornelius, eh? Sounds a little more unstable, maybe. Unstable, yeah. A a little more relatable, maybe. So let's see what craziness happens to Peter. Back to Acts, verse 9. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could this vision mean? Okay, we got Peter. He's hungry. While he's waiting for food, he goes up on the roof to pray. Now, roofs in biblical times, they're often the most popular place to be. They were used for storage, for resting, for worshiping. Now, while he's up there, he goes into a trance and he starts seeing and hearing voices. Now, listen, I've been hungry before. I felt my head go a little bit swimmy because I needed some protein, but I've never gone into a trance seeing things. But like I said earlier, this type of hearing from God, it was not unknown. So Peter sees the sheet with a bunch of animals on. It gets told by the Lord to kill them and eat them. And true to Peter's argumentative nature, he says, no, I'm not doing that. I never eat what I shouldn't. Oh, Peter, 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 Peter. One would hope that if the Lord himself spoke in a way that was undeniable, you wouldn't argue. You'd be more like Cornelius and be like, yes, Lord, absolutely. Whatever you say right away. But nope. Oh, no. Peter has to state his reasons for not doing what the Lord tells him to do. Look, love him or hate him. I am so glad Peter's in the Bible because he is so relatable, isn't he? You know, we sometimes know undeniably what the Lord wants us to do, but we try and argue and reason our way out of doing it. All right, back to Peter's vision. He sees this vision of a sheet filled with different kinds of animals. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking, what? Why a sheet filled with animals? Why was he told to kill and eat them? The Jewish traditions regarding eating back then and now is that they don't eat an animal that's considered unclean, like pork or shellfish, among others. Consumption or even handling these types of animals or food is taboo. People who did would need to ritually purify themselves to get rid of their uncleanliness. The animals Peter saw, some were tame and some were wild. This represented the Jews and the Gentiles, the clean and the unclean. But the Lord says to Peter, don't call something unclean if God has made it clean. So Peter's standing there, dazed and confused. And this whole vision happens three times, which is very interesting, considering Peter seems to love the number three. Remember, he denied he knew Jesus three times. As Peter is puzzling over what he saw, the men Cornelius sent, they arrive to meet him. He goes with them back to see Cornelius who invites him into his home. Okay, let's pick it up there. They talked together, that's Peter and Cornelius, and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me, why did you send for me? Cornelius explains how he too had a vision that he was supposed to find Peter and bring him here. Then he says, now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. This was big. This was big. This was something unheard of. Jesus didn't go into someone's, Jews didn't go into someone's house. 
if, if they weren't Jewish as well, they didn't do that. It was the whole clean and unclean thing. So for Peter to go inside Cornelius's house to sit at his table, that is making a bold statement. And the people who were inside the house, they want to know, what was the message the Lord's given you? What, what did he say? What does this all mean? Verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He's the one all the prophets testified about, saying that anyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. This is astonishing news. This is the starting of the mission that Jesus came to fulfill. This meant that Peter, who was used to doing things a certain way, mainly that Jesus died and rose again, forgives and gives eternal life to the Jews. But wait a minute. That verse said that to everyone who believes in him can be forgiven, even if they're not Jewish. God revealed to Peter the amazing news that God shows no partiality, that he sent his son everyone, not just for the elite, it's for all. This meant that the people Peter was used to having around his table, they were going to change. They would look different. They would speak different. They would eat different things. They would obey different laws, have different customs. Peter's small world was about to grow. His understanding of the love of God was about to greatly expand. The people at his table were about to look very different than anyone who'd sat there before. This is the start of what is called the Great Commission. In the book of Mark, Jesus told his close followers to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. The mission Jesus had and still has is that his great love and salvation is for everyone. He shows no partiality. He wants a truly global community made up of people of all races, languages, tribes, and tongues. There is a place for everyone at his table. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. These two characters, Cornelius and Peter, were, were a part of God unfolding his elaborate plan, a plan to include all peoples, all nations. What can we learn? What can we learn from this wild story of visions and trances and the starting of the church? Well, I had three questions I asked myself after studying this. Three questions that I'll put to you as well. Here's the first question to ask ourselves. Do I have a personal faith with Jesus? If you look at Cornelius, I mean, this, this was a guy who who the Bible says was devout. He prayed, he gave, he did what was moral, he did what was right. But until he heard the good news of what Jesus did by dying for him and accepted and believed it, it was then that his faith finally became personal. It went from a religion to a relationship. See, I think a lot of times we think that if we just do good stuff, you know, if we just try our best to be like a moral person, to, to give to charities, to help the poor, to be kind, to maybe go to church every now and then, you know, throw up a prayer. Maybe that might be good enough to call ourselves a Christian. Maybe we even have a checklist and we're like, see, see, look, look at all the good things that I do. And, and there's nothing wrong with doing good things, but just doing good, just being a good person. That's not what a relationship with Jesus is. The Bible says God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Cornelius had to be rescued from his rules. What he was doing wasn't wrong. God even blessed it. But if he had kept on that path without having a personal relationship with Jesus by just doing good, he would never have been able to work his way to salvation. So the question is, what about you? What about me? Do we live under that idea that if we just try and be good, which none of us can 100% do? I mean, come on. 
I'm lucky if I make it to nine o'clock without messing up. Do we live with that idea that if we believe, you know, there's a higher power up there or something and we do enough nice things and be kind, then then we're, we're okay. We're okay. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Stop right now and answer this question. Do I have a personal faith? with Jesus. The second question I ask myself, and I will now put to you, is do I have a problem with pride? See, Peter was already a Christ follower. He had walked with him, talked with him, saw him when he died, saw him when he rose again. He he had a very personal relationship with Jesus. But when Peter was asked to do something the Lord wanted him to do, he argued. And as we already learned, he did that a lot. Where Cornelius had to be rescued from his rules, Peter had to be rescued from his pride. You know what? It's easy to look at Peter and shake our heads, you know? Peter, would you just chill? Don't you know by now that Jesus always has a plan, that he always has our best interest at heart? Why don't you just listen to him and obey? Don't you know that keeping your eyes on him will keep us walking on the water, not falling in it when you look away? Oh, Peter, why do you always think your way is best? Maybe that's where the saying for Pete's sake comes from. I don't know. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Before we get all judgy, let's take a look at our own selves. What do we do sometimes when God lays out a plan for us, an instruction? For example, when he tells us to be thankful in all circumstances. Are we? Well, let's see. Hmm. During this pandemic, have we been doing any complaining? I haven't. Oh. Have you? When we don't like something we have to do at work, do we say, you know what, if I ran this company, if we ran things my way, it would be so much better around here. What about at home? Ever complain at home? Ever lash out or speak harshly because you were anything but thankful? God's instructions to be thankful in all circumstances it gets lost because of our pride. We think we can do it better. That's not a good enough plan, God. What about when God tells us to serve others, when he says to be kind, even when it's incredibly difficult, that annoying neighbor, that exasperating kid in your classroom, that EGR, extra grace required friend, your spouse, your parents, your in-laws, your ex, yikes. How easy is it to show up with a bad attitude It's no trouble at all to ignore those around us who are in need of our help. No, we don't have the time. We don't have the patience for it. Our agenda is way more important. We're on our way to the top. We're going places. Move over, people. I'm important. Pride. Yeah, Jesus says, whoever wants to be a leader among you must first be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even Jesus came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, when I ask myself this question, do I have a problem with pride? I had to answer yes. Yes, I do. What about you? The third question I asked myself, and by now you know I'm asking you to, was do I struggle with prejudice? This whole story is about two worlds colliding, the Jewish world and the Gentile world. It's about God's table and who's invited to sit there. It's about who the church is supposed to be made up of. It's about a truly global community made up of people of all races, all languages, all tribes and tongues. In a racially tense world, radical racial diversity has been a 2,000 year reality. It's what Jesus wants. He died for all. He offers salvation to all. Not just to little Cheryl in our little world in New Brunswick. Not just a little older Cheryl in a little older world in London, Ontario. He offers it to all. In the book of John, Jesus says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. In the church, there is no room for racism, bigotry, or prejudice. 
our doors, our tables should be open to all. Now, probably most of you have heard about Mahatma Gandhi. He was the primary leader of India's independence movement, well known for his hunger strikes. There's a story about him that goes like this. While Gandhi was practicing Hindu, Christianity intrigued him. In his reading of the Gospels, Gandhi was impressed by Jesus, whom Christians worshipped and followed. He wanted to know more about this Jesus that Christians referred to as the Christ, the Messiah. One Sunday morning, Gandhi decided that he would visit one of the Christian churches in Calcutta. Upon seeking entrance to the church sanctuary, he was stopped at the door by the ushers. He was told he was not welcome, nor would he be permitted to attend this particular church, as it was for high caste Indians and whites only. He was neither high caste, nor was he white. Because of the rejection, the Mahatma turned his back on Christianity. With this act, Gandhi rejected the Christian faith, never again to consider the claims of Christ. He was turned off by the sin of segregation that was practiced by the church. It was due to this experience that Gandhi later declared, I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. Now, I realize that sometimes Christians don't always follow Christ the way he was meant to be followed. And Gandhi was basing his decision on people. And we all know we mess up. If he had looked further to see Christ, his decision may have been different. Nonetheless, it's sad, isn't it? It's tragic that people can turn to or from Christ because they look at Christ's followers and how they live and how they're welcomed and how they're listened to and how they're learned from. The church has done some damage here. The church has made some big mistakes here. And this turns people away from Christ. Jesus never meant it to be that way. No one is beyond his love. No one is left out of his grace. So I ask myself and you ask yourself, do I struggle with prejudice? Do I believe that we're all made in the image of God? That we're all precious in his sight? Do I take to heart the very clear and straightforward instruction to his followers when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, all corners, all peoples of the world. All are invited to a seat at the table. All matter to God. Do I show that or do my thoughts or even my actions do something completely different? This crazy story about Cornelius and Peter has so much to teach us, so much to tell us about how Jesus came to save us from our rules and our regulations, our pride and our prejudice, what Jesus wanted the church to look like. So let's ask ourselves these hard questions. Do I have a personal faith in Jesus? Do I have pride? Do I have prejudice? You know, it takes honesty. It takes some confessing. It takes asking forgiveness. Then let's celebrate this amazing thing called the church that we get to be a part of. Let's pull up a chair. Let's add chairs. Let's invite and bring anyone, everyone to the table, just as they are. Let's laugh. Let's learn. Let's love. Let's show the world what the church was meant to be. Freedom in Christ, salvation for all a truly global community made up of people of all races, all languages, all tribes and tongues. There is room at the table for all. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, It means everything to me that you were able to share that with us. I hope that you all enjoyed it, and I will see you again next week. Have an amazing week, and may God bless you and keep you. Amen.